Now I'd like you to turn with me please to Matthew's Gospel in chapter 15 and we're going to begin our reading in verse 29. Um, we're going to follow the passage pretty well as we go. Uh, so this particular passage, which is verse 29 to 31, not a big, not a big part. In fact, it's only two sentences, you'll notice. Verse 29 is one sentence, and verse 30 and 31 is the second sentence. And uh, we, call, like we call it, Christ heals many people. Um, it's very interesting that in the life of Christ, um, sometimes not everything is said that we would like to hear. So, for example, on this occasion, it says, And Jesus departed from thence, and came nigh unto the Sea of Galilee, and went up into a mountain, and sat there. And normally speaking, when Jesus sits down, it's to teach the people, but he may not have had, it might have been a, a bit of a melee, lots of people going about, and he might not have had an opportunity to teach, or he may have done. We don't know. We just don't know the details. But what we do know is, in verse 30, it says, Great multitudes came unto him having with them those that were lame blind dumb maimed and many others and cast them down at jesus feet and he healed them insomuch that the multitude wondered when they saw the dumb to speak and the maimed to be whole and the lame to walk and the blind to see and they glorified the god of Israel. So who did they glorify? The God of Israel. Because at this particular time in the history of the world there weren't any Christians. This was before the day of Pentecost when the church was founded and therefore uh, there were Christians in the world but there were people that loved God um, and there were people that in the old covenant worshipped the Lord um, and they worshipped who? The God of Israel. So they worshipped. When Gentiles worship the Lord, uh, the God that they worship is the same God as the God of Israel, but he's called by a different name. He's called for them the God of heaven. And you go right through the New Testament and have a look, and whenever Gentiles think about God, it's, they always talk about the God of heaven. But Israel talk about the God of Israel. Um, it's very interesting also that that little word, it says uh, in verse 30, and they cast them down at Jesus' feet. Now that's a very interesting Greek word. It means to throw somebody on the floor. Literally, it means that. It means to say, yeah, you, you sort it, and you just dump them at his feet. <laughs> it's quite surprising, really, isn't it, having a word like that? Now it's almost impossible to imagine the impact of the Lord's miracles to see the blind see for the first time or to have their eyesight restored it's very difficult for us to imagine today the 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 lame walking it doesn't just talk about the lame it talks about those that are um, where does it say it now maimed so these are people that <coughs> presumably have had an accident or maybe even in war, they've had an injury whereby they've been maimed and they can't walk properly anymore. <coughs> and it's also interesting <laughs> that the dumb spoke. What does a dumb person sound like when they speak? They sound perfectly normal because not only can they speak, but they can hear what they're saying. So they, it takes a while for them to moderate their speech. Sometimes when they start to speak, when they've never spoken before, they're a bit loud. Okay. Um, and then they then begin to soften their voice. Now it's very, very interesting. The whole question of miracles comes up in this passage. Now these miracles were not, these miracles are not seen today. Now I'm going to be quite forceful on this. These miracles are not seen today. Now I've been a Christian now for, well, I, I, since I was 12, okay? Since I was 12, I came to a real firm a realization that Jesus died for me and that I was saved. And since that time, I have never, ever, ever seen a miracle. And I've been around a lot. 
and I've seen the TV programs and I've seen the films and I've seen the videos on the internet. Um, but these miracles were very outstanding. These were people that have never seen, suddenly they can see. That's, that's, quite, that's quite amazing. These are people who had maybe never walked. I used to work with uh, disabled children years ago and sometimes their legs would all be twisted up and they had no strength to be able to even, no muscle to be able to stand up. But the Lord Jesus could make those muscles work again perfectly without any physiotherapy, Ruth. Got that now? <coughs> no physiotherapy necessary, uh, no educational necessary, nobody teaching them how to walk up a step and down a step. None of that. They just could walk immediately. These miracles were absolutely outstanding. If these miracles were occurring in Telford today, we would all know. You know why? Because it would be in the <coughs> Telford Journal. They would say, we've got to tell you something. We've been to a church and 30 people got out of wheelchairs that have never walked and they could walk again perfectly fine without any physio. Now that would hit the newspapers. Also, if they went into a hospital and they went into a cancer ward and they just healed everybody's cancers. Or if they went to the children's home where all the children are blind, like at Condover, and a miracle occurs and suddenly Condover has to close down because there's nobody there anymore. They've all gone home. You see, these miracles, I think we need a little bit of a wake up call. This is not occurring like this today. Now, does that mean then that we don't believe in praying for people who are sick? Of course we do. We've had our prayer time just now, and part of that is to pray for those of us that are sick. <coughs> and, and can God heal today? Of course God can heal today, but that isn't the question. The question is, is God healing today like this? And I think the answer is no. Now, I'm going to... Um, if it were true, if it were true, okay, then you could actually go to the local hospital and you could empty a complete ward and all the nurses could go home. That isn't happening today, I'm afraid. Now, I want, you, I want to quote some names to you. Put your hand up. I want you to put your hand up if you know the person, okay? So the first one is Martin Luther. Put your hand up if you know. All right? That's three of you. Uh, John Wycliffe. Man who wrote the first Bible in English. John Bunyan, Baptist minister from Bedford, who imprisoned for 13 years because he was a Baptist minister. Charles Haddon Spurgeon, yeah, the famous uh, uh, pastor here from London. Um, Anthony Norris Groves, there we are, brethren missionary to uh, India, and to, uh, yes, to India. Uh, I think it was India. No, it might have been it might have been what we now call <coughs> Iran. Might have been what we call Iran, yes. Um, George Muller, heard of, heard of him? Yeah, absolutely. He was uh, the great uh, pastor and philanthropist in Bristol. Uh, Mary Slesser. Mary Slesser, famous missionary to uh, Iceland, I think. Um, James Hudson Taylor. Okay. David Livingstone. Oh, yeah. Okay. John Wesley, Ooh, yeah. George Whitfield, yeah. Billy Sunday, Ooh, yeah. Ooh. Billy Graham. Now, what's the one thing all of these people have in common? None of them heal people. They just didn't. Did they pray for people? Oh, yes. And sometimes the Lord would answer prayer. Nothing wrong with that at all. But you see, back in biblical times, they weren't just prayers. They were healers. That's quite a difference. They didn't say, well, we'll have a prayer meet and you might be healed. No, they actually just healed them. That's very different. None of these people. Now, these are all our great spiritual heroes. I can think of uh, 30 other names. Martin Luther, the greatest uh, Protestant in Germany, never healed a soul. Billy Graham preached to more people than anyone has ever preached to ever. And he's never healed one person. So does that mean he doesn't care? Of course he cares. Does that mean he never prays? Of course he prays. Does that mean that the blessing of God doesn't rest on him? 
have caused the blessing of God rest on him. Now, we might have slight differences of viewpoint about things. All Christians are different, you see. You take James Hudson Taylor, who established the China Inland Mission and evangelized China in a very amazing and dramatic way. And I think it was in 1909, there was the Boxer Rebellion in which hundreds and hundreds of his missionaries were murdered by the Chinese. It was, it was all over a misunderstanding, but they were murdered by them. And uh, James Hudson Taylor had to leave the country. But was he a godly man? Of course. Was he one of the best godly men that we've ever known? Of course. So why didn't he heal somebody? If it's available, then he could have done, couldn't he? And we can talk about lots of other people. David Livingstone went to Africa and opened up Central Africa to the gospel. Okay? He was a doctor, a medical doctor. How many people did he heal? Didn't heal any. You know, as Christians, if we're not careful, we end we end up being so oversimplified in our thinking. For example, let's suppose, Ruth, you're cutting yourself a sandwich, right, and you get your sharp knife out. I presume they're all nice and sharp. And you nick your finger. Do you say, oh, well, I need to pray to the Lord now for my finger to be healed? Do you do that? Why? You just go to the cupboard and get a plaster and put it on it and forget all about it. Right? So when a person then falls over and bumps their head, does the person sit there and say, well, I won't call an ambulance. I'll just ask the Lord to heal me. It's very practical, isn't it? You don't do that. Did, when you did this, Harley, on your face, did you sit there and say, Lord, heal me? Or did you go inside and ask your son to put a plaster on it and for you to sit down and have a cup of tea? What would you do? Plaster on. A plaster on and a cup of tea. So what you're doing, you see, is just perfectly ordinary god has created you with a body that can actually heal itself it can actually make the scars go away but it needs to have certain conditions it needs to be clean i need to have some rest you need to have good nutrition in your body to be able to rebuild your face if you get a scar okay but that isn't what jesus was doing here the lord jesus here was going to a person that's blind and has never ever seen and now they can see that's, that's outstanding. It's completely at another court altogether. Um, and did Christ, is another question, did Christ always heal people? Now you may say, yeah, of course he did. He was Jesus. No, he didn't. When he went to the pool of Bethesda, it says there was a great multitude of impotent folk, blind and halt and withered, waiting for the moving of the water. How many people did he heal that day? Just one. Wow. So has the Lord Jesus lost all of his compassion? No. Does it mean that the Lord Jesus was unable to do it? No. <laughs> the whole issue of healing needs to be rethought. It needs to just think about it again. When the Lord Jesus went to Nazareth, his own town, he didn't heal us all. And he, he says he could do no great miracles there because they had no faith. So the whole issue then of healing is a little bit more complicated than it appears. And although it sounds obvious, you know, I, I meet people every day and I see them on the internet every day in which they say, I'm not very well, I'm going to ask God to heal me. And it sounds obvious that you can do that and you, it sounds obvious that God will heal you. But let me ask you something. Does the healing come? And the answer is no. One of the great embarrassing things about life at the moment is that all the great healers of the last 30 years are now very elderly and very sick and some have died. You say, well, that's not unusual, is it? No, of course it's not unusual. They got old. And they got sick. And they died, some of them. So, you know, we need to just have a little bit of a, a reality check about the whole question of healing. Now, we're going to pass on from that to verse 32. Now, in verse 32 to 39, we have Christ feeding 
4,000, not the 5,000. This uh, miracle is also spoken about in Mark chapter 8, verse 1 to 10. Um, it says in verse 32, Then Jesus called his disciples unto him and said, I have compassion on the multitude, because they continue with me now three days, and have nothing to eat. And I will not send them away fasting, lest they faint in the way. Now, obviously this is, this is the Lord Jesus having an understanding about what fasting is. They hadn't brought any food. They'd been with the Lord Jesus for three days and he hadn't provided any food for three days. So he says, I've got compassion on them because they could faint. Faint. A faint is what happens when you have a sudden loss of blood sugar or a sudden loss of, of blood pressure and your head just blacks out and you fall on the floor. Normally you fall in a big heap and you, generally speaking you don't hurt yourself. But you can hurt yourself, of course. Um, the, the Greek word is very interesting. It means to be unstrung. You know, like when a musician takes his stringed instrument and he just takes the tension off all the strings so he can put it in the cupboard. And then when he gets it back out of the cupboard, he turns them all back up again so he can play. Um, it means to just woo, to just go relaxed. It means to just completely relax. And the Lord Jesus didn't want people up in this mountain place to be walking down the pathway and all of a sudden it's all rocky and they faint they're going to go straight down and there's going to be boulders and stones and they were going to be in danger so the lord had an interest not just in their spiritual welfare but he had an interest in their physical welfare as well and he had compassion on the people because they're not eaten for three days of course the question we need to ask is why didn't he feed them on the first day and the second day and the third day I don't know. I don't know the answer to the question. I mean, what we what we do get is the impression uh, from the passage is that feeding the people isn't an automatic thing. It's not automatic. They came to Jesus to see him and to hear him. It's not automatic that he was going to feed them. Just like when we pray to the Lord, it's not automatic that he's going to heal us. Sometimes he might. He might just heal us. And sometimes he won't. But it's not automatic, that's the point. Um, his disciples said unto him, uh, When sh should we have so much bread in the wilderness? Because Jesus said, um, let me read the previous verse. Um, <clears throat> he's speaking to the disciples. He says, I have compassion on them because they continue with, I will not send them away fasting lest they faint. And his disciples said unto him, When sh should we have so much bread in the wilderness? as to fill so great a multitude. Now there was 5,000 families. How many is in a family, Bill? How many is in a family, do you think? What do you think? Have a guess. Round number. Minimum three. Got to be three, isn't it? It's got to be a minimum three, likely to be more like about um, um, an average of about, say, five, four or five, it would be the average. So there's 4,000 families. That's a lot of people. Okay. And Jesus said unto them, how many loaves have you? And they looked around and they said, well, we've got seven loaves. It might have been similar to the other miracle of feeding of the 5,000, where they had four, uh, they had five loaves and two small fish. Here they say, we've got seven loaves and a few little fish. So that's like a little sardine, right? That, that big. Um, uh, but, uh, so he commanded, he commanded the multitude to sit down on the ground, uh, to sit down on the grass, by the way, that is. Um, and then he took the seven loaves and the fishes and gave thanks and break them and gave it to the disciples and the disciples to the multitude. And they did all eat and were filled. And they took up of the broken meat that was left, seven baskets full. How many baskets did they take up? When they fed the 5,000? 12. 12, absolutely. This time, for some reason which we don't know, it's 7. Okay? And I hear all sorts of people saying, oh yes, very significant number 7. Listen, the only thing significant about the number 7 is they just counted them. That's, that's the only thing that's significant. Nothing beyond that. And when they did eat, uh, and they that did eat were 4,000 men besides women and children so now we've got the proper picture haven't we it's four thousand men and the wives 
and everybody else and the children. Of course, there would have been widows there. There would have been single people there. Uh, there would have been everybody there, aunties and uncles. Um, and he, and, he, and the, when, they'd, when they'd ate, he sent the multitude away and took ship and came into the coast of Magdala. Now, these baskets are not the same as the baskets in the other miracle. These baskets are hampers. Now, how big is a hamper basket? This big, isn't it? If you want a hamper, I'll tell you how big a hamper basket is. It's the same word used by Luke to describe the basket that Paul was let down from the wall of Damascus. He must have climbed inside it and they had a rope on the handles and he let them down. So big enough to contain a man. So seven baskets full of bread left over and fish is a huge, huge amount. Um, we see this in Matthew 14, verse 20. Now, this miracle is different to the feeding of the 5,000. I can't emphasize that enough. A dear brother, a friend of mine many years ago, gave us a sermon in which he tried to cram the feeding of the 5,000 and the feeding of the 4,000 into the same story. And so I don't really understand it, but it must be the same incident. Well, they can't be the same incident. They occur in a different place. They got a different number of people. They got a different number of bread. They got a different number of fishes. They got a different number of baskets. It's just all different. It's just all different. There's nothing about the two that are the same. Um, different circumstances. Everything was different altogether. And so the great thing about reading the Bible is this: is looking at it more closely, not jumping to conclusions but looking at it more closely and taking in what's being said. Very important. Um, and later, of course, in chapter 16, the Lord speaks about the two feedings, the feeding of the 5,000 and the feeding of the 4,000 as being separate incidents. He says to them, do you remember when we fed the 5,000? They go, yeah. He said, do you remember when we fed the 4,000? They went, yeah. Now, how could we make those the same? Well, we can't, can we? It's just completely different altogether. So there we are. We've had two interesting little passages. We've got a bit of an insight into the life of Christ here. He had a tremendous effect upon people. Far more than we can ever imagine. I mean, imagine going to that early place in uh, Galilee and all the people bringing all their sick and just throwing them down at his feet and he just heals them all that's outstanding now if you know of anybody in England today that's doing this I would like to see because I believe in God I do believe in God I believe in God completely but if you know of anybody it's a challenge to everybody here and everyone that would ever hear this if you know of anyone that's doing this let me know because I don't think it's happening. It's just not happening. Uh, and as for the second one, if you know of anybody that is feeding 5,000 people at once, or 4,000 people at once, let me know, because I'd like to see it. Would you like to see it? Put your hand up if you'd like to see somebody raised up today that can feed 5,000 people with seven little baskets. Sorry, with se uh, seven little loaves. Now, I would love to see that. And I really, really do believe in God. But we need to have this reality check. The reality check is this, that this is the Lord Jesus. And he's doing something that doesn't occur today. And wouldn't it be wonderful if we could have a time clock and travel back in time and see it for ourselves? That would be absolutely wonderful. That would change your day, wouldn't it? Wouldn't it change your day to see... All the sick in a whole region of Galilee healed and walking about and chattering. And the dumb going, Jesus has done this to me. Wouldn't it be wonderful to hear and see all of that? But we can't see it today. Jesus is in heaven today. And as far as we're aware, there are not people on the earth. However, I'm going to say something as I close. When you and I, as Christians, have gone to heaven... God is going to work with Israel again. And I've got nothing to prove this at all. But it would not surprise me the least if the 144,000 
Jewish evangelists could do all this. Because they will have powers. They'll have apostolic powers. They'll have an apostolic message. The kingdom is coming. Repent. And they'll have apostolic powers, I think, to be able to do what Christians can't do today. I think, but I've got nothing to prove that. But I think that that would be a good supposition to have. Good.